broken up pieces of my life, shattered but not destroyed. Your cross was the bridge that filled the void. Living in your grace, I'm overjoyed. And now I know oh, oh, your love goes higher, higher. Sweeps me away, I'm drawn closer, closer. Every day, sinking in deeper, deeper. Into your grace, my life will never, ever be the same. I come alive again. Take a breath of my eyes open. Feel the bones in my heart beat. Jesus has saved me, feeling alive again. I'm feeling alive again. Feeling alive again. Running into your arms. Now that is lost and love has won. The power of the grave you own. so glad that you took a few minutes out of your day to celebrate with us. I wanted to pause before we keep the service going this morning and just recognize that going through all this has begun to take its toll on our mental health. I know even the strongest of us out there, we would say, you know what, we've reached the point where, where there's some hope that things are opening up again, but it has just begun to grind on us. So, so I just want to recognize that, that mental health is real and realize that mental health for many of us has taken a significant hit during this time. And so I just wanted to give you some encouragement before we keep going this morning with this. This is what the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 4.8. He says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's Philippians 4.8. I would encourage you guys to maybe look that verse up and to write it on a three by five card and put it somewhere where you can see it during the next few weeks because you're going to need to think about those things. You're going to need to focus on what is praiseworthy and excellent. You're going to need to think about those to be able to combat the negative thoughts that you're going to be feeling as we continue through this grind. Again, thank you guys so much for hanging out with us today. We hope that this few minutes that you spend with us is good for your mental health because we have a God that is awesome. We have a God that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and then rose again on the third day. We have a God who will open up the clouds and pour down his love and mercy and grace upon us. We hope this song ministers to you. Oh, with this 
thunder with a new future to tell for the dry season is over there is a cloud beginning to swell to the skies heavy with blessing lift your eyes and offer your heart jesus christ open the heavens now we receive the spirit of god we receive Every seed buried in sorrow will transform in its own time. You are Lord, Lord of the harvest, calling a home now to arrive.
Father, Lord, we, uh, we, we're here just, uh, just humble, God, because it says in your word that um, when two or more are gathered, when we are uh, thinking of you, when we are worshiping you, that you are, you are right there with us. So no matter where we are, if we're in an empty building or sitting at homes with our families, God, you are right there with us. And Lord, we, we receive your flood this morning, God. We receive your rain. We receive your love, your grace, your forgiveness. God, we thank you for never turning your back on us, God. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for keeping us healthy, Lord. God, I just pray for everybody as, as we're going through this right now, God, that, that we just see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, the light on the other side, God. And God, I just pray you just keep us going, keep our hopes up. God, we receive you this morning. It's your mighty name we pray. I'm excited about today. Are you guys excited out there? I'm just going to assume that was an enthusiastic yes. We are continuing our series simply called Seven, where we are rewinding from the resurrection and going through the seven statements that Jesus made while he hung on the cross. Today we're looking at the fourth statement in the third installment. Now, before you shut this off and frantically go looking for the third statement, how did I miss it? Uh, let me explain what's going on. Yes, this is the third part of the series, and we're looking at the fourth statement that Jesus made while he hung on the cross, because the third statement that Jesus made had to do with his mama, had to do with his mother. And since this statement is going to, or since this series is going to be continuing on until Mother's Day, I thought it would be appropriate to take the statement that Jesus made to his mom and turn that into a Mother's Day message. So with your permission, we're going to mix the order up just a little bit, going to get a little crazy, all you OCD people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. But we're going to be looking at the fourth statement in the third part of this series. And maybe, everyone say maybe. Oh, come on. Let me hear you. Maybe. Maybe we'll be able to be live together again on Mother's Day. Stay tuned, and we'll see if that becomes a reality. Hey, if you have a Bible with you today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible anywhere in your house or you're watching this on your phone, we'll put all of the verses magically somewhere about right here, and you guys can follow along in just a minute. And while you're looking for Mark 15, I want to tell you about the most important day in the ancient Jewish calendar. Now, now stick with me. This is going to go somewhere. The most important day in the ancient Jewish calendar was a day called Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus 16, God gave Moses very detailed instructions for the people of how to celebrate this most important day on the calendar. The reason this was the most important day on the calendar is because this was the only day that the high priest was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies. This was the part of the tabernacle or later the temple in Jerusalem that was separated from the rest of the tabernacle or temple. This was divided by a curtain in a sealed off area. It was where the Ark of the Covenant rested. This represented God's presence with his people. If you've seen the old Indiana Jones movie, then you kind of know about the Ark of the Covenant and, and the, the powers and 
and so you kind of got an idea of what we're talking about here. If you don't, you go back and watch Indiana Jones. Great movies. You could binge watch those right now. Well, not right now because you're watching this, but after you get done with this, go back and binge watch the, the Indiana Jones movie. But, but the, the Ark of the Covenant was there. And on this one day out of the year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go through this elaborate purification process where he would get himself ready. He would go into the Holy of Holies again, which represented the the presence of God, and he would make atonement for the people's sins. Uh, Atonement is simply a word that means pay for. The high priest would go in and perform different sacrifices to pay for, to atone for the sins of the people for that entire year. One of these sacrifices had to do with two goats. I was thinking about goats this week, and I couldn't help but think about this last Christmas when my wife and my two girls, we got to go spend a few days at a cabin in the mountains of North Georgia. And next to this cabin in this little town, there was this tourist place called Goats on the Roof. It was literally a place with goats... (laughs) <laughs> on the roof, <laughs> exactly. I, I don't understand it. I didn't get it, but my girls absolutely love this place. In fact, to this day, you ask Ella what her favorite part was of, of our vacation. She would say, goats on the roof. Can we go back to goats on the roof, Daddy? Like, it wasn't the snow tubing or any of the other things that we did. No, it was goats on the roof. But the goats in this story wouldn't fare so well as goats on the roof because the high priest would actually cast lots, would basically gamble to see which goat would live and which goat would be condemned to death. This is actually foreshadowing of what the, the, the soldiers at the bottom of the cross, at the foot of the cross, would actually gamble for Jesus' clothing. It was foreshadowing of that. So the priest would slit the throat of one of the goats that was condemned to death. A little graphic. He would then take the blood and put that on the mercy seat, which was the top of the Ark of the Covenant. This symbolized God's throne in heaven. The wages of sin is death. The only way that sin can be forgiven is if blood is spilt. And so the blood would be spilt and put on the mercy seat. After the priest had made the atonement, he would leave the Holy of Holies with his hands still dripping with blood. And he would take the the bloody hands and, and, and wrap them around and cover the head of the goat that was deemed to live. They would then take this goat that had the sins of the people covering its head. They would take it out to the edge of the city and release it out into the wilderness, never to be seen from again. Now, Jeopardy question real quick, okay? Does anyone know what the name of the goat was? Any guesses? If you said scapegoat, you're exactly right. This is where we get the phrase from, that even though the people did the crime, God made the animals do the time. Now, God's purpose wasn't just to kill animals. God created animals. He loves animals. This isn't some kind of PETA thing, okay? This is simply God giving the people a graphic illustration for what Jesus was later going to do, that Jesus was going to become our scapegoat. In fact, the Apostle Paul said that that Jesus was the substance to all of the foreshadowing that happened in the Old Testament. Jesus' blood was spilt to forgive our sins, And then he became the scapegoat that carried them away, never to be seen from again. He made our atonement. He atoned for our sins. He made the payment, the payment that he did not owe and the payment that we could not pay. Now, I want you to take all of that, which you probably didn't ever really want to know about. I want you to take all of that atonement and goats and all of that and slitting of the throats. I want you to take all of that and put it on the back burner just for one second as we begin to look at the fourth statement that Jesus made from the cross. Jesus has now been hanging on the cross for quite a while. He was crucified at 9 a.m., and this is what Mark records in Mark 15, starting in verse 33. He says, Now when the sixth hour had come, you can write down noon in your notes, because that's when this was. It was noon, it's the sixth hour. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Up until this point, we've seen Jesus have remarkable focus. He was able to ask forgiveness for the people that nailed him to the cross. He then answered the prayer of a fellow criminal that was hanging on the the cross, condemned to die. He said, surely you'll be with me today in paradise in response to the man's simple declaration of faith. He then speaks to his mother, as we're going to see in a few weeks. But this fourth statement, you have to agree, this is different. 
This is, this is like the climax of the movie. We've been climbing the mountain, and now here we are. Th- th- this statement, there's something different. There's, there's a, a hopelessness to it. There's even a, a, a terror to this scene. Up until this point, Jesus has been remarkably focused. Up until this point, he, he has maintained his composure in the midst of pain and suffering that you and I can't even begin to comprehend. In fact, his focus has not even been on himself. It's been on other people. It was on the people that needed forgiveness. It was on his neighbor on the cross. It was towards his mama. But then you you get to this moment and these words, and something drastically has changed. In fact, nature agreed. This was supposed to be the brightest point in the day. It said that it was noon, the, the sixth hour. The sun should be shining at its brightest, but Scripture says that there was a darkness that fell over the region. And for the next three hours, in dark silence, Jesus suffered what's been called the crucifixion within the crucifixion. This darkness was finally pierced, the silence was finally pierced at 3 p.m. when he breaks it with this cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, The symbolism in all this is amazing. Think about it. Jesus was born at night. Night is supposed to be dark. It's supposed to be still. It's supposed to be quiet. But it was anything but that, because there was a star illuminating the way to Bethlehem. There was a host of angels in the cloud lighting up the sky. Instead of silence, there was the angels' chorus singing about the Christ child that had been born. Now, now, now contrast that with Jesus' death. It was supposed to be the brightest part of the day, but yet it was the darkest part of the day. There should have been a hustle and bustle, and yet there was silence. Why? Because Jesus came to chase away the darkness, but it cost him his own light to extinguish his own light to be able to do that. You see, Jesus defeated death by actually dying. There's lots of terms that the Bible uses to describe what we would call hell. One of these terms that's used frequently is the outer darkness. Jesus was going through that at this moment. He was in the outer darkness. He was going through hell. He was having sin after sin after sin, the weight of the world laid upon his burning and battered shoulders. His father was turning his back on him, rejecting him here in this moment. Again, theologians refer to this as the the crucifixion within the crucifixion because while the physical pain was unimaginable, the spiritual pain now was beyond anything that we could ever comprehend. The the bloody hands of the high priest were being placed upon Jesus' head as the sins of the world were laying one after another upon him. Even though Jesus had never done anything wrong, Jesus was experiencing now, during this three-hour period, Jesus was experiencing what it was like if he had committed every single sin in the history of the earth. His father began to turn his back and to reject him and to no longer look at him. His blood was spilled. He carried away our sin, never to be seen again. And it was as if creation couldn't even look upon this horrific scene. And so darkness covered the region for this three-hour period. All throughout the Old Testament, God hinted to this moment. In Daniel chapter 9, it says this, verse 26, The Messiah will be cut off, talking about cut off from the Father, and have nothing. In Psalm 116, the disciples actually sang this song after the Lord's Supper because Jesus must have known verse 3 was coming. It says, the cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. The prophet Isaiah famously said in Isaiah 53, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. The New Testament authors would come along and echo what the Old Testament authors had been saying, what God had been pointing to for thousands of years in Galatians 3. It says, but Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he hung on the cross, he took upon himself. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Peter says it this way, 1 Peter 2, 24. He personally personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, we are healed. It it was these moments that I would argue that Jesus dreaded the most. He was perfectly human. 
and also perfectly God. So, so I don't think he was looking forward to the physical pain, but I don't think that even compared to what he was dreading the most. I think he dreaded the spiritual aspect of this more than anything. In fact, one week before his crucifixion, in John chapter 12, he tells his disciples this. He says, my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, keep me from having to go through this. No. This is the very reason that I have come to this point in my life. Listen to me. The crucifixion within the crucifixion wasn't an afterthought. This was the mission. This was the plan for Jesus to become your scapegoat and mine. But listen to me. Even though Jesus knew this, even though Jesus knew this, it tormented his soul. The night that he was arrested, where do we find Jesus? He was in the garden crying out to his heavenly father saying, God, if there is any other way, take this cup from me. He began to sweat drops of blood. Why? Because he was not only dreading the physical pain, but he was dreading the reality that his father in heaven was going to reject him and to cut off relationship with him. Rejection was nothing new for Jesus, though. Jesus had been rejected his entire life. Joseph and Mary, there was no room for them in the end. No room for Jesus when he was born. Jesus' siblings rejected him. It wasn't until after the resurrection that his siblings began to realize who Jesus was. Jesus was rejected by his own people in his own town. He was rejected by the Jewish leaders of his, of his day. They, they knew the prophecies and should have seen Jesus coming, but yet they rejected him. He was rejected and abandoned by his disciples when he needed them the most. He was betrayed by Judas, one of his disciples. His closest friend on earth, Peter, denied him three times. Jesus was familiar with rejection. He had been rejected at every step of the journey. But this rejection, there was something different about this rejection. This rejection seemed much more personal because in this moment, Jesus, for the first time in his life, felt what it was like to be separated from his heavenly father. Jesus, for the first time, realized what we have realized, what it feels like to be cut off from Eden. In that moment, for the first time in history, God the Father and God the Son were separated. And so Jesus calls out, he cries out from the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John Stott was an Anglican priest and theologian, one of the influential leaders of the evangelical movement. He said this, he said, our sins blotted out the sunshine of his father's face. Look at these hours on the cross and you are looking into hell, darkness, loneliness, and abandonment by God. Jesus experienced darkness so that we could receive the light. Jesus experienced abandonment so that we never had to be abandoned. Jesus experienced distance so that we could draw near. Jesus went to hell so that we could go to heaven. Jesus died so that we could live. And the crazy thing about all this, the most remarkable thing about all of this, is that even though Jesus hated talking about it, he hated to think about it, even though Jesus, the night of his arrest, was in the garden praying, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, which should tell us everything that we need to know right there. If there was any other way, certainly the Father would have said, okay, we, we can do this. People today think that, that, that we don't need Jesus, that, that all that God cares about is if we're a good person, if we're a good moral person and look after other people. Jesus isn't the only way, but, but listen to me. Th think about that. Don't you think that if there was any other way that when his son was on his knees crying out to him and bleeding drops of blood saying, God, if there's any other way, don't you think in that moment the father would have looked down upon his son and whom he loved and would have said, you know what, son, you've been faithful up until this point. We can just tell them to be good. Yeah, yeah, we can just tell them to be good and that'll be enough. No, 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 God didn't say that because there was no other way. This was it. Jesus was the only hope. Jesus was the only plan. And the most amazing thing about this is Jesus knew it all and he was willing to go through it for you and willing to go through it for me. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame. 
Jesus disregarded the shame of the cross, disregarded the shame of being rejected by his father, disregarded the shame of dying as a common criminal. He, he, he was willing to go through that shame. Why? For the joy that was set before him. And what was that joy? The joy of seeing you and the joy of seeing me reunited with our heavenly father. That was the joy that was set before him. His joy was you and his joy was me. So listen to me. If you feel like nobody loves you right now, if you feel like God does not love you, then I just want to challenge what you're feeling with the truth that God was willing to go through all of this. Jesus died thinking about you. He didn't want you to be cut off. He didn't want you to be in the outer dark darkness. He wanted you to have life and life abundantly, to have resurrection life. That's what he wanted. He, he loves you. The supreme moment of suffering here that we see was also the supreme moment of achievement. Just like a flower being crushed to reveal its scent. So Jesus, taking upon the sins of the world into his heart, brought salvation to the world. But unlike the goat that got his neck slit and the goat that was chased out of the city never to be seen from again, unlike those two stories, this wasn't the end of the story, was it? Yeah, we just celebrated this. We celebrate this every Sunday, that Jesus didn't stay in the ground. That this was just the beginning, that on the third day he came back from the grave with the keys to death and hell in his hands. And he promises to you and he promises to me the hope of heaven and salvation and forgiveness of sins for anyone who believes and is willing to receive. And I know some of you that have been tracking with us now for a couple weeks, maybe you're new to all this and you're saying, you know what, I'm still trying to work all this out, how that happened. Like, I'm still trying to work it all out, Pastor Brian. Listen to me, people way smarter than me have already tried to work this out. People way smarter than me have gone through gallons of ink writing about this. But here's the thing that I want to say to you. Working it out is not the solution. Working it out is not where it's at. Worship is where it's at. Worship is where it's at because Jesus is the only one who is worthy of our worship. Wherever you are right now, just give him some praise. Give him some glory. Thank him that, that he was willing to go through all of this to prove that he loved you and to prove that he loved me. So here's what I want to do in the time that we have left. I want to do the same thing we've done every single week as we've looked at these scenes and tried to understand these scenes as best we can. I want to pull some takeaway truths out of this. We need to know what we need to know and what we need to do. So if you want to take some notes, grab some paper, open a new note on your phone, and write this first one down. Scripture in his heart gave him traction in his grief. Did you write that down? The scripture in his heart gave him traction in his grief. What do I mean by traction? Well, traction is, is firm footing. Traction is not having your feet slip out from under you. Traction is why athletes wear cleats, because they dig into the ground so their feet don't come out from under them. It's, it's firm footing. It's a firm foundation. And that's what I see in this story, is that Jesus got traction, even though he was going through grief like we cannot even begin to imagine. Even though he was going through unimaginable grief, he got traction in that moment. How? Because he had scripture tucked away in his heart. Here's what I mean by all that. This fourth statement from the cross is a direct quotation of Psalm 22. Jesus straight up recycles what David had said in Psalm 22. You're like, well, why is Psalm 22 important? Psalm 22 is important because Psalm 22 is probably the most vivid illustration for what crucifixion was like in all of the Bible. You would think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the Gospels, would be the best place to learn about the crucifixion. But the crucifixion was so gory, it, it, it was so, you couldn't even look at it, that all the New Testament authors could bring themselves to do was to write, and they crucified him. No, if you want to learn about the crucifixion, you have to go to Psalm 22 or places like Isaiah 53. In fact, I would encourage you to read Psalm 22 this week. It's an amazing text. Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, the amazing thing about it is that this was a thousand years before Jesus and 600 years before crucifixion had ever been invented. And this is important for this reason. Not only was it the confirmation and the fulfillment of prophecy, this is also a clue what you and I are supposed to do when our lives are on fire. Listen, Jesus defeated death, but we still have to go through the valley of the shadow of death. You see, Jesus defeated the substance, so that all we have to deal with is the shadow. Jesus dealt with the real thing. We deal with the shadow of it. But let's be honest, the shadow of death is scary. We're dealing with that right now. The shadow of death, it hurts. 
it breeds uncertainty. So what we learn from Jesus is that when God's word is tucked deep inside our hearts, that when we go through times like this, that it will come up, that it will come out of our mouths, that it will spill out and give us comfort along the way. But not just any scripture, particularly worship, particularly praise. Do you know that Jesus quoted the Psalms more than any other book in the Bible? Why? Why did Jesus quote the Psalms more than any other book in the Bible? Because he knew that singing was our ticket to suffering. He knew there was power in praise. So if we want to be like Jesus, finding ourselves singing through the valleys, if we want to be like Jesus and find the words of God spilling out of our mouths and giving us perspective with the problems that we're facing, then we have to be like Jesus and hide God's word in our heart. We have to be doing that now. We have to be doing that on a daily basis. Why? Here's why. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he did not have a fancy app on his iPhone where he could just kind of thumb through and find verses about suffering. Jesus wasn't flipping through the concordance of his Bible looking for, uh, let's see, uh, crucifixion, crucifixion, cru oh, Psalm 22, David talks about crucifixion. No, no, Jesus was constantly reading the scriptures. Jesus was constantly memorizing God's word. We, we had this gap in understanding of Jesus from his, his childhood until he became an adult. There's this gap where we don't know much of what happened, but there is one scene where we're allowed to kind of peek over the hedge and, and, and look in, and the scene that we have is that Jesus was faithful to be in the house of God when the scriptures were taught. That Jesus wanted his roots to go down deep into God's word, to understand the scriptures all about them, so that he would have traction that God's word would come spilling out of his mouth when he faced problems and trials, that they would inform his perspective of what he was going through. If we want to get to a place where we walk by faith and not by sight like Jesus did, then we have to be tucking God's word down inside our heart. We have to be memorizing God's word, tucking it way down in there, in season and out of season. We've got to be tucking it down in there as if our lives depended on it. Parents, listen to me real quick. If you only get your kids to church once a month or once every six weeks or only a few times a year, listen to me. And I'm not saying this to bash you. I'm saying this because I love you and care about you. If, if that's how often we're getting our kids to church, then what deposits are they missing in their souls that they're going to need for the trials and tribulations ahead of them? If for no other reason, plant your kids in the house of God so that when the storms come, when the trials come, God's word will spill out of their mouth and inform their perspective of the problem that they may be facing. That's the first thing. Second point is this. I see that Jesus, he overcame despair by rushing to God in it. He overcame despair by rushing to God in it. I want you to notice that in both of these most of these themes are found in the text right here. He says, my God, my God, that's overcoming his despair. But what was his despair? He says, why have you forsaken me? Both of these themes are found in this one statement. There's the, the overcoming the despair, and then there's the despair. Why have you forsaken me? I find it fascinating that Jesus asked the question of why. Yes, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And he did the same exact thing that you and I do when we go through trials and tribulations, when we go through unjust moments and, and, and go through sickness and, and go through pandemics and loss of work, loss of income. Jesus did what you and I do. He asked the question of why. God, if you're a God of love, why would you let this happen to me? God, where have you been? God, why don't you seem to be answering any of my questions? So Jesus, in the middle of the greatest despair that the world has ever known, he asked the question that we ask. He says, why? Why? But he didn't ask this just for his own benefit. He asked it for our benefit as well. It's the question that every single human heart has been burning with since sin entered our world. All of the things that we can't understand, all the questions that seem to be unanswered, Jesus asked why for us. But then he also modeled what you do with your why. And I want you to pay attention to this so carefully. If I've lost you, come back. Jesus modeled what we should do with our why. He, he says, my God, my God. He's refusing to let go of God. Do you see that? He's got a why. He's got questions. But he said, my God, my God. He is, he, he is holding on to God. So in the middle of your despair, in the middle of your look for, 
for, for work in the middle of your health issues and your worries about your family and your despair and all of that. You got to hold on to God with both hands. You got to hold on with both hands. Jesus didn't just say, my God. He says, my God, my God. He was doubling down. He was holding on with both hands. He, he rushed to God in the middle of his despair, and in doing so, he overcame it and had triumph. And the same can be true of you, and the same can be true of me. He looked at his why, and he said, God, I don't understand the why. I don't understand the why, but I trust in you. I trust that you understand the why. I trust that you are still God. I trust that you are still the king and you are still on your throne. I know that many of you may be tempted right now in this moment to let go of God and to hold on to your why. You're tempted because of what you're going through, the despair, the pain, the hopelessness that you feel right now. You're tempted to, to hold on to your why and let go of God. But there's something that I need to tell you. God sent me to tell you that the why ain't your friend. Your why can't deliver you. Your why can't save you. Your why can't make all things work out for the good. That's why we have to hold on to God with both hands, especially in times like this. Prayer, prayer like this. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Would you say that with me at home? God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. We have to trust that even though we don't understand the why, he's going to work out the why. You hold on to God with both hands when you go through a situation like this. Here's the third point that we see from this. Jesus teaches us that we never need to doubt God's love again. We never need to doubt God's love again. Do you see that in this passage, that we don't have to doubt God's love ever again? That's what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans. He says, rarely will someone die for a good person, right? There's not many people lining up to drink poison for you right now, is there? It's a, it's a pretty small list. In my life, maybe one, maybe two people might, might, might die for me. And that's Paul's point, that rarely will someone die even for a good person. But God, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were what? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still dead in our sin, he died for us. And now out of that death comes life and comes love. I uh, was reminded of a story that took place several years ago. It made national headlines when a husband bought his wife flowers for Valentine's Day. Now, that doesn't usually warrant a news story. Now, maybe for some of you men, buying flowers for your wife may be newsworthy. But getting flowers for your wife isn't a big news story. But when this wife received these flowers, it wrecked her. Totally destroyed her, and here's why. Her husband had actually passed away the year before. And she wondered how in the world did she get these flowers. Maybe it was some kind of cruel mix-up at the, the floristry. She thought maybe her kids were trying to take the place of their father since the father couldn't buy, buy the flowers that, that they would buy them. And so finally her curiosity got the best of her. She contacted the florist and said, I, I have to know, how did these flowers get delivered to me for Valentine's Day? The woman in the florist shop began to look through her records and found out, well, uh, apparently your husband, when he found out that he was dying last summer of brain cancer, he came in and made all the arrangements, made all the payments, and now for the rest of your life, you're going to receive flowers on Valentine's Day. From the grave came this amazing love, this undeniable love. And listen to me. I hope, if nothing else today, that you have heard that through this crucifixion within the crucifixion that you have heard Jesus say to you, I love you. I love you. I love you. And look, I'm sorry for what you're going through right now, but I need you to know that I love you and that my love is greater than that thing. This is what Romans 8.32 says. Paul says, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? We're to look at the cross and to understand that God's love for us is set, that we don't have to doubt that anymore. Paul is arguing from the greatest to the least. He says, what's the greatest thing anyone could possibly ever give up? The answer, your kids. The most imaginable thing for most of us to, to ever sacrifice or to give up would to be the life of one of our kids. And so Paul is saying, hey, if God was willing to give up the thing most precious to him, then won't he also give you all these other things? Won't he help you with your employment issue and your business issue and your health issue and your worry about your family? 
Listen to me, when you're tempted to let go of God because of some problem in your life, when you're tempted to let go of him because of some problem in your life, you need to realize and I need to realize that that problem, as big as it is, isn't the biggest problem that you ever had. The biggest problem that you ever had and I ever had was the problem of sin and God was willing to sacrifice and brutally murder and turn his back on his son so that you and I could be saved and forgiven and set free. We think about the pain that Jesus went through. Think about the pain that the father went through. Imagine as a parent looking down at your child and seeing someone crucify him to a tree. Imagine seeing them spit and mock and ram a spear into his side. Uh, Imagine watching your child gasping for air. And then knowing that while they went through this and needed you the most, that you had to turn your back on them. Friend, we never need to doubt the love of God again. God is for you. He is a good God. He loves you. He has plans and a purpose for you. And he's hoping that we just pray a big prayer in a time like this, an audacious prayer. He's saying, I already took care of the biggest need you had. Why don't you try me with some of these other things? We never need to doubt the love of God again. Here's the final lesson from this, and we'll be done. Write this down. We will not escape if we neglect salvation. We will not escape if we neglect salvation. We have something that no other religion has. We have a God that died for us and did everything for us. That's why there is no other name for which we are saved than the name of Jesus. Jesus isn't just the best way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And so I want to be as clear as I possibly can before we wrap this up. Jesus is your only hope. That's it. (laughs) Jesus is your only hope. There is no one else coming. There is no one else that can help. This is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. He is your only hope. To my point, Hebrews 2, 3 says, So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? If the Father did not flinch, and did not hesitate to pour out his wrath upon his son in whom he loved, in whom he was well pleased. What do you think God would do to you and to me if we ignore the steps that he went through to save us and to forgive us? And I'm not trying to manipulate anybody today. Every one of us has to make our own decision about Jesus. It is a decision. It is a choice because God will not force his love on anyone because his love is a gift. We all have to decide to accept it or reject it. But I would be guilty of spiritual malpractice if I did not tell you that you will not escape without Jesus. Jesus paid it all. He paid the price. He's done it all. All we have to do is believe and receive. There is no amount of good works that will save you. Only faith in Jesus. All you have to do is to believe and receive. I want to end this with an invitation right now, an invitation for anyone who has never placed their hope and faith and trust in Jesus as their hope for salvation and their only ticket to heaven. If you would, wherever you are right now, would you just bow your head and close your eyes, even if you're alone? The Bible says that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to anyone who believes in his name. And so as we hush our hearts, absorbing your love, God, that was demonstrated so richly by the cross, I pray that everyone would sense your great love for them. These drastic measures that you went through in order to save us. I pray that there's anyone that's hearing the sound of my voice right now that has yet to call on you. I pray that they would right here and right now. If you've never had a moment in your life where you accepted Jesus, I just want to pray a simple prayer. You can pray in your heart and in your mind. Say this to him right now. Say, Jesus, you got me here. Thank you for never giving up on me. I believe you are who you say you are. God's son who died and rose again to pay for my sin and to give me new life. From this moment forward, I choose to place my faith and trust in you. I rest in the finished work of the cross alone and not in my effort. I invite you into my life to save me and to lead me and to change me 
And I believe you will because of Jesus. If you prayed that prayer this morning, that's the most important decision that you could ever make. It's why our church exists. It's the heartbeat behind our church. We want to do something for you if you prayed that prayer this morning. We would like to send you a Bible in the mail and a letter that outlines a little bit more of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If you would like to receive that Bible, then all you have to do is just email me. My email address is brian, B-R-I-A-N, at churchofthesuncoast.com. Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at churchofthesuncoast.com. And we'll make sure that you get a Bible and you get that letter. This Bible says there's a party going on in heaven whenever one person turns in faith to Jesus. You can't have a party without presence. We just want to celebrate and send this to you. We're not going to bug you or invade your privacy. We just want to send you something discreetly in the mail, something that will help you take your next steps on this journey with Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that there's someone out there today who prayed this for the very first time, someone who gave their life to you. Father, I pray they continue to follow and continue to search. Thank you for what you've done in their life, and thank you for what you've done in all of our lives by sending Jesus to be our scapegoat, to pay the atonement, to pay the price for our sins. We love you, and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. And before you guys jump out of here and enjoy the rest of your Sunday, I want to mention just a few quick things, and then you can duck out. The first thing that I want to mention is I just want to thank you guys for your continued generosity and faithfulness to give, even though we're not meeting together. Because of your generosity, we have been able to meet every need that has been brought before us. I think that's amazing. Go God. You can give them some applause, clap, or something. So here's what I would encourage you to do. Would you possibly consider the the stimulus check that that most of us got as a part of the legislation that was passed, would you consider maybe tithing off of that? It's interesting, in the legislation, they actually made provision for most people when they changed the tax code a number of years ago. The standard deduction is like $24,000 or something like that. So, So most people never actually hit the standard deduction, so they don't have to itemize anymore. That includes people's charitable giving. But what they've done is they've allowed like a $320 allowance that you can actually itemize, which actually works out to be a tithe if you have a family of force. I would encourage you, if you would like to put some of your stimulus money to good work, obviously I think it's going to help you, but if you would like it to help other people, consider giving right now. You can go to our website, churchofthesuncoast.com, click on the give button, and you can actually give right now. Second thing that I want to mention is we would love to have the opportunity to baptize you. We were scheduled to have baptisms in April. That didn't happen on our birthday, but we are going to be doing baptisms in May. We're not exactly sure of the date yet, but if you have recently, maybe you've been tuning in, you've, you've accepted Jesus, the very next step of obedience, your next step of faith is to get baptized. Baptized is simply an outward expression of an inward connection. You're letting everyone know that you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. And if you've done that recently, I can't think of a better way to ring in being back together again than to celebrate through baptism. If you would like to get baptized, again, you can email me. That's the easiest way right now, right? Just just email me, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at churchofthesuncoast.com, and we'd be happy to get you some information about baptism. Also, make sure you check out our live event, which takes place every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. It's a chance for me to share something serious. It's a chance for my girls to be goofy and Cheryl to try to keep the peace between us. But we're a ministry family. We want to minister in the best way we can right now. That's kind of what we've stumbled upon. So I encourage you to check in live Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for our live event. Last but not least, an update on when we're going to get back together. Our goal was to be back on May the 3rd because that's what the government had said, that when this is over back together. They've issued some guidelines now. If you go to our website, you can see uh, a link to the guidelines that the CDC has has laid out. I'm sure you're familiar with most of those. Our governor has also issued a commission that has laid out some guidelines. We are currently reviewing those, and as soon as we make a decision on when we can open up again, we will let you guys know, and I cannot wait for that day. It is going to be off the chain. It's going to be epic, and I can't wait for that. I also know that there's going to be some fear and trepidation Uh, about kind of venturing back out into a public space. So I want you to know that we've done every precaution that we can. We're going to blow our seating out so that people are separated. Uh, We're going to take some more precautions in our kids' area. Uh, We we probably won't have food and stuff from the cafe for the first few weeks. We're going to do everything we can to be safe. Uh, But I believe that when that day comes, I think we need to pack God's house and celebrate that God has brought us through this. His, uh, his, His word said that we will be free, and we can celebrate that. 
when we get back together. Guys, I love being your pastor. If I have not met you yet, I can't wait to meet you in person. Thanks for tuning in online, and we'll see you next Sunday for the next statement in seven. God bless you guys. See you then.